Good afternoon, Rich Nass with Embedded Computing Design. I'm here at the Infineon October Tech. Not Oktoberfest, October Tech. That comes later. That comes later. I'm here with Maher Mata. He's the uh, president of Infineon America. Did I get that right? That's that's right. Very Regional good. president. I answer to pretty much anything. I guess. <laughs> good good to have you, Rich. <laughs> that's my line. I say it all the time. But um, this is a great event. I've been here for the last few years, and um, a year ago we sat down for a very similar interview. Yes. Um, and I asked you a year ago um, what what was new, what had happened in the previous year. So let me let me start with the same question: What's new since last year? Yeah, a year is a long time, but at the same time, it, it went by quick, didn't it? Um, so yeah, let's see. Over the last year, I would say uh, innovation continues. So mm -hmm. some of the topics that we discussed last time, including powering AI, continue to uh, be accelerate and become uh, even more relevant, given what's going on on the AI side. But besides the uh, AI sector, which I think we've covered many times, uh, a couple other new areas, I would say, that have uh, accelerated. One is quantum. All of a sudden, you start to hear about quantum computing becoming more tangible, more real. Uh, a couple of years ago, when we were at this event, we donated our first ion trap. Um, at this event, we have much more mature demos. We have customers here who are demonstrating platforms that are pretty close to being real-world usable. So that's exciting. Okay, so let me interrupt you because it's what I do. I yeah. interrupt people all the time. Do you expect to make money from quantum computing now, or is that an investment for the future? No, uh, we're making money this year. Uh, we'll make more money next year, so it's a okay. real commercial viable business. Okay, so did I make wrong with your train of thought? No, okay. no, I'll come, right, back. I'll, I'll come back to the topic. <laughs> It'll take more than that, Rich, come on. Uh, yeah, so what else is accelerating or new? Um, it's not new, but for us, it's becoming a little bit more relevant with the robotics. I mean, you see it in several showcases, both with people starting to uh, deploy robots. Uh, we have several Silicon Valley companies, a uh, long list of names there that are starting to actually demonstrate them. We had one here today uh, that uh, you saw. Um, so we're excited about it because we have a lot of solutions. We have, uh, of course, the traditional sensing piece of it. Uh, we have the edge AI piece of it. Um, we have motor control, and then the other piece that also is relevant to what's new is our Ethernet solution. Mm -hmm. We recently acquired the Ethernet portfolio from Marvell, mainly for automotive. It's their world leader in automotive space. But we believe that uh, that same Type 1 Ethernet will be quite important for robotics. So, so that's another relatively um, accelerating area. So you mentioned AI a couple times. Let's talk about AI. Um, you use the term that everybody uses, edge AI. Now that could mean different things to different people, but and and I, I use it pretty specifically where edge is the edge computer, and then there's the endpoint. And you guys happen to cover both. Um, do you see? Are they melding together, or are they two separate things? I mean, it depends on, on how you architect the system. I mean, if you're looking at a uh, thermostat, for example, Edge would be in the thermostat mm -hmm. without it calling home via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to the cloud. So that's how I would define Edge. In a car, it might be a zonal architecture where you have, you know, uh, the, yes, there is still cloud, so the car could talk mm -hmm. to the cloud, but there's also central processor. Right. But there may be an Edge component to it for the camera that is sitting on top of the, uh, the wheel well or what have you. So there the edge would be near the wheel rather than edge right. being the central computer. So it depends a little bit on the system, but in general, uh, when I think of edge, I think of compute at close to where uh, you need to make a decision. Uh, to, to try to minimize the communication to another computing platform. In the car, it would be the central processor, uh, and the thermostat will be going up to the cloud. So that makes that's, that's how I think of that's it. That's what makes sense. So the other part that I want to talk to you about that I've been hearing so much about lately, and it was actually brought home in the keynote here today, is about the power that's required for AI. And somebody said, I don't remember if it was you or one of the other speakers, that the amount of power that's being drawn in the United States hasn't changed a lot over the last, I think they said 20 years. Because we've done such a good job with efficiency, we're obviously there's many more devices, but they, each device uses less power. 
but now with the AI data centers coming online, is the amount of power that is required is astronomical. Mm -hmm. So that's two issues. One is the power itself, mm -hmm. and one is the heat. How do we deal with that? And that. I'm assuming it's playing right into your wheelhouse because you guys are the power experts and somebody said earlier, you want silicon, we got you covered. We got silicon carbide, we got you covered. You want, you want GAN, we got you covered. But um, was that just a, a really good guess on your part that this was gonna happen? Because a lot of these things that you've put in place didn't just happen overnight. This is a few years in the making. Yeah, look, Power some, somehow is always overlooked because mm -hmm. everybody um, thinks of the, the sexy uh, TPU, GPU, uh, CPU, what have you, and it, it, it's sort of like power is, is in the background. And I think, did we get there by accident? No. I mean, we've been in the power business for over 25 years. Uh, we've been in server and compute for, for many years, certainly powering with many generations of Intel processors mm -hmm. back when there was the VR12 and, and, and uh, subsequent generations. So we've taken that legacy, that heritage of power, and you can say, did we forecast that AI is gonna come and we see this exponential curve from 200 amps to, to, to now over 2,000 amps for across the yeah, Okay, you're being very kind, Rich. I, no, the short answer is no. but. Did we recognize the curve as it started to happen? Yes. Did we recognize that this is going to require innovation to really uh, address it, both on the things you said? How do you deliver the power, particularly as the current goes up, uh, you know, given the amount of uh, resistance and impedance you have in these traces? Uh, you know, we can't really discuss power delivery last time with vertical power delivery. Uh, those are absolutely required, and the heat. You mentioned the heat yep. as well. So how do you mount it? How do you do it? So uh, it's a combination of things. It is, uh, you mentioned our three base technologies. We have these Lego bricks that we can really utilize in different ways depending on the power class, switching frequencies and what have you, but also packaging. This is requiring a new area over the last few years where now the solutions are being delivered in modules when we start to create assets. And we're shipping a lot of these modules, which people sometimes say, you're a semiconductor company, you're shipping modules? Yes, in power, that's where the density is going. It needs to be integrated. So, so was it all foretold in a crystal ball? No. Did we have the base technologies and were we able to recognize those trends? Yes. Okay, one more AI question that's in a different direction. Um, are you a believer in using the AI in, internally as, as an engineering group? Do you encourage your own R&D guys, your engineering team, to make use of AI when doing their jobs? Yeah, I mean, this is becoming an area that is definitely accelerating uh, kind of AI in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, we are starting to look at places to use that. Um, you know, an example might be uh, our app notes, uh, you know, where we are, oh, and uh, some of our community forums, where mm -hmm. we have communities where people can ask questions, and people are uh, providing answers either from Infineon or, or, you know, other knowledgeable members. So we're starting to look at, for example, how do you harness that I'm just giving you an example on applications where you can take all this data and then uh, distill it into a question or somebody could type in, hey, I'm looking for X, Y, Z. Right. The data is there. So yes, that's an area for our app application teams are looking at it. Uh, for sure in design, we see that as well. Um, whether, whether it be designing next generation MOSFETs, uh, we're looking at that and it's being utilized. But, you know, from an engineering point of view, it's got to be a little bit more nuanced and careful. You cannot use AI blindly. Mm -hmm. You still have to check its work. Um, so the days of saying, okay, whoop, done, you know, in, in the first example, you don't publish that <laughs> note right away. Right. You still need an engineer to read it and see, did it extract the right data? Did it make sense? Same thing with a model for a MOSFET that you extracted. Okay, how does this look like? Maybe you run a traditional simulation, a Monte Carlo on it, to make sure it did what you it thought it's doing. I mean, we see that personally, if you use ChatGDB or Perplexity or whatever, thing, it's still not there yet. You still have to double check it. And we know from some of our customers, uh, anything really infrastructure or critical, you can't, you're not ready to just turn it over. Human still has to check. Very good. Thank you, Mar. You're welcome. Good to have you. See you here at Devlin. See you next year. See you next year. <laughs> it's our 10th.
10th anniversary next year. Very good. Should be a good time.